نحمد ونصلی ونسلم على رسوله الكريم اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا ومولانا محمد واصحاب سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم صلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وصحابك يا سيدي يا حبيب الله In the previous lecture we looked at uh, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's grandfather and we had one major event during his lifetime still to cover which was the attack of the people of the elephants ashab al fil in the language of the quran or abraha and inshallah we'll continue with that and then move on to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's father sayyidna abdullah radiyallahu ta'ala and so the last thing we finished on was the the fact that all of not just sayyidna abdul muttalib and all of the parents and forefathers of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam have had prominent positions uh, within the arab nation uh, within the rest of the um, within the rest of the community and sayyidna abdul muttalib was not any different he was the same um, and some of the p- particular sort of um, virtues that are ascribed to him is that after the zamzam uh, spring or well had been uh, hidden for quite a long time to the extent that people had started to forget about it he was the one who had the honor of finding it and excavating it again um and also then once it was excavated also to find all the ex- very uh, expensive sort of artifacts and so on that were thrown into it at the time and so in that sense as well um great prominence one of the greatest events during his life is actually um uh, this army that was brought by abraha and the king of yemen um he was the emperor or king of yemen as appointed by um the najashi negus the king of abyssinia of habsha and so once he appointed him in yemen he had a huge church built because they were christians uh, by faith he had a huge church built and th- this it all begins uh, at the point where the king of abyssinia he appointed uh, a person as governor of yemen and he appointed abraha as his deputy and they began to quarrel amongst each other and so they both raised an army and they set a date and they were in front of each other ready to fight each other when abraha said to the the other one eriat he said why are we fighting amongst each other we're going to end up fighting with each other our own soldiers are going to kill each other why don't me and you settle this uh, ourselves so i will fight you a one on one duel and whoever wins takes over command of of yemen and so uh, they agreed to this and it was abraha who uh, actually he won and so he then took over control of uh, of yemen and so once he took over control of the governorship of yemen in order to please because he wasn't actually the appointed governor uh, was this other person and so he just killed him and he's taken over his position and he was governing there on behalf of the king of abyssinia and so in order to please him he then had this huge church built 
Right? So this is the background to that church. Normally, you know, uh, you hear most uh, sort of accounts of this story. They mention this church, but that's how it came into being. He built it then to please the king, and in a hope, uh, in the hope of retaining his position as the governor of Yemen. It was his view that people should, who go to do Hajj of Baitullah of the Kaaba in, in Mecca, rather than doing Hajj there and pilgrimage there, they should come here to Yemen and they should visit this, uh, this church that he, he'd built. And so he uh, announced that he was going to attack the Kaaba, he was going to attack Mecca and he was going to level the Kaaba to the ground. And he, he said that if, you know, once the Kaaba had been leveled, then people would have no choice but to come to his church for pilgrimage instead. When the Arabs heard about this uh, Abraha's plan, they were extremely angry because remember, they were very territorial right, uh, in their nature and they were also very protective of the Kaaba. Even though they were, the, you know, majority of them had become, almost all of them had become idol worshippers and, you know, the Kaaba itself was a place where they housed many of their idols, but they were very protective about the Kaaba. They did realize that this was their uh, heritage and built by, you know, their ancestors and so on. Um, and so they became extremely angry when uh, Abraha's plan um, Sort of when they heard about it, and one person, uh, whilst he was traveling through Yemen, he went to visit this church, and during his visit, he deliberately he found time um, to, you know, when no one was looking or when no one was around, he found time to soil um, the church, right? He defecated in the church. And obviously, as you can imagine, when, uh, when Abraha found, found out about this, he was absolutely furious. This person had lit, you know, he'd literally gone and defecated inside that church. And at that point, he then decided, he said, that, you know, that's the last straw, and I'm going to uh, launch an attack on Mecca. The people of Yemen actually had a great deal res of respect for uh, the, the Meccans and the Kaaba in particular. The people of Yemen itself uh, were uh, sort of respectful towards the Kaaba. And so when they heard this, um, one of the leaders of Yemen, Zu Nafar, he decided that he was going to stand in the way of Abraha. He wasn't going to let him uh, do this. And so he uh, sent him an announcement of battle, of war. And so um, in, in an effort to protect the Kaaba before he, they even arrived at Mecca. And there was a huge, a very fierce battle between Abraha and uh, this uh, Yemeni tribe, but eventually, because of his sort of uh, heavily, you know, outnumbering them and more resources and other reasons, um, Abraha was successful. So he defeated them, and <coughs> he captured this leader of this Yemeni tribe, Zunafa. And as he was contemplating killing him, he said to him, "He said, don't kill me, because." <coughs> I will be <coughs> I'll be more useful to you alive than I will be dead. And so uh, in this way he managed to he managed to buy some time and he managed to save his life because uh, Abraha began thinking and he decided to to let him live but he uh, he had him imprisoned and so um, he then became prisoner of uh, Abraha. Uh, again when they traveled towards Mecca as they were traveling, um, uh, they came across another tribe and Nufail bin Habib, he raised an army with his tribe and some other tribes of that locality amongst the Arabs to try to fend off this attack from Abraha. 
and to protect Makkah and to protect the Kaaba from this. And so, again, it was Abraha who was successful. He was uh, victorious. And Nofel also uh, was imprisoned. Again, he was presented in front of Abraha and he said the same thing to him. He said, uh, don't, don't kill me because you need someone to guide you into the Arab uh, territory and to Mecca. And I will do that uh, job for you. I will take you, I will guide you to Mecca. And so again, Abraha, he decided n not to kill him. And he, um, he imprisoned him as well. And then he began to direct them and to guide them towards Mecca. As he began to travel towards Mecca, this person, Nufail bin Habib, he was with him, he was guiding them. And when he came upon Ta'if, which is just outside of Mecca, um, Mas'ud Thaqafi, his tribe, Banu Thaqif, uh, he took a few men from his tribe and he came to see Abraha. The reason for this was because the people of Taif, even at that time, they had built, they'd constructed their own little, uh, you know, their own uh, Kaaba. And they had their idols placed in it and they would do tawaf around it as well, just like people did tawaf around the Kaaba in Makkah. And they felt afraid that, um, you know, he might mistake this as the real Kaaba and, you know, demolish this and launch an attack against us. So he took some of his people and he went to Abraha, he went to the king and he, he pledged allegiance to him and he said, we are your, we are your servants. And we will, you know, we will respond, and uh, we will accept anything that you command us to do. We're not going to uh, stand in your way at all. And this, uh, this sort of, you know, this box that we've built is not the Kaaba. This is, you know, this is our own place of worship. You, the Kaaba that you have set out for, is in Makkah. And so they said that we are going to send someone with you who's going to take you to Mecca. They offered to, in order to protect their own settlement and their own, uh, you know, place of worship, they offered to send someone with him who would guide him to the Kaaba. And so they sent a person, they appointed a person to go with him to Mecca. They set off then from Taif towards Mecca and they arrived at a particular place just outside Mecca and this person that had been given to uh, Abraha by the people of Taif as a guide um, he died you know, just naturally at that place he, he died his life was over and he, his time was up and he died and so he was buried at that place when they when the Arabs it's customary amongst the Arabs when they go to that place, this person named Abu Raghal, when they go to that place, they stone his grave because he was the one who, uh, you know, who had accepted to lead Abraha to Makkah to attack the Kaaba, and so they would stone him. <laughs> so they, they, they stone that grave, <coughs> and. Uh, so, Abraha, during it, so once he died, um, there was a person in Abraha's army, he was a, an Abyssinian soldier, um, by the name of Aswad bin Maqsud. He sent him ahead towards Mecca, and what he did was he went out towards Mecca and in all the uh, sort of the lands, the grazing patches outside of Mecca where the, the cattle of the Meccans were grazing, he went there and he rounded up everything, all the animals that he found and he brought them back to Abraham. 
Amongst those were 200 camels that belonged to Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib as well, the grandfather of the Prophet And at that time, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib uh, was the leader of the Quraysh and the other um, sort of uh, tribes as well. Now, some of the tribes, they, some of the sort of the Meccan and the Arab tribes, they thought about putting up a fight against Abraha. They thought about raising an army against Abraha. Um, but when they saw, you know, the huge sort of size of his army, the resources, and so on, um, they they weren't able to. You know, gather enough courage to actually do that, and they they felt helpless. You know, they they thought we're never going to be able to defeat him, and so they they scrapped that idea of trying to fight against him. And Abraha then sent his senior messenger, and he came into Mecca, and. He said to him, go into Mecca and find the leader of these people and tell him that the king wishes to fight with you. you know, basically, he sent him ahead with the announcement of, uh, of battle and um, he said that if you don't come in my way right? if you allow me to do what I want my purpose of coming here is to demolish the Kaaba if you don't come in my way and you allow me to do as I please then you know you you don't have to die then it's not necessary to kill you otherwise then you need to ready yourself to fight with me and he said to him, if he doesn't, if you feel that he's not intending to fight, doesn't want to put up a fight, then bring him back with you. I want to see him. And so this person, he came. He entered the confines of the masjid uh, in Makkah, Masjid al-Haram. And he, he asked the Quraysh, he said, who's your leader? And he was told, it is uh, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib bin Hashim. And so he went to uh, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib and he gave Abraha's message. Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib, he said to him, he said, I have no intention of fighting with him. I, I have absolutely no intention at all of uh, putting up a fight against him. And physically, you know, in terms of the means that we possess, I don't think we could raise an army as big as his or something that could compete with his. This is the, the noble house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was raised by his beloved friend Khalil Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, and he's going to protect it himself. It doesn't belong to me. This is Allah's house, he will protect it. And if Allah wishes to protect this house, then there is absolutely nothing that Abraha can do to demolish it. When he heard, when he, you know, the messenger, when he was 100% certain that, you know, they're not going to put up a fight, he told Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib, he said, then come with me and let us go and see the king. Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib took some of his children, a few of his children with him, and he went to see Abra. When they arrived amongst his army, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib, he asked about Zu Nafar, which was the person in Yemen, if you remember, the, that Yemeni tribe that had tried to stop Abra you know, even before he left Yemen. Um, and who were defeated, he was their leader who then uh, who'd said to him, don't kill me, I'll be more useful to you when I'm alive. And he was, had been in prison. This was that individual. Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib, he went and asked about this person. 
because he was an old friend of Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib. Right? They were, they were uh, very good friends. And he was taken to see this person who was, at that point was a prisoner. And Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib said to him, he said, um, you know, this difficulty, this calamity that we're facing, is there anything that you can, anything at all that you can do to help us? And he replied, he said that, unfortunately, I am now a prisoner, I'm under their control. So physically, there may not be a great deal that I can do to help you now. And however, you know, um, I do know somebody in his ranks, in his army, I know one of his very close, the king's very close servants. And so, he's called Anis, and he's a good friend of mine. And he said that I can introduce you to him, and he will give you a good introduction in front of Abraham. And that way you can get to meet Abraham and, and discuss this matter with him. And so he... Uh, called uh, this person Anis and he introduced him to Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib and he said to him, he said that uh, if there's any possibility, if there's any way that you can arrange a meeting between Abraha and this, uh, this person then, then you need to do that. And so he did. And he took Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib, this person Anis, he took Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib to go and see Abraha. And he introduced him, he said, this is uh, the leader of the Quraysh. And he is also uh, the leader and you know, he's the person responsible for the caravans that come out of Mecca you know, in, for the purpose of trade and so on. And he's extremely generous. His generosity is such that his spread the Starkhan, his spread is always is always out. You know, the, in other words, that there's never a time when he when he's not uh, feeding people. You know, even f forget the humans, even the the mountains and the birds and the animals, they eat from his spread from the from his Dastarkhan. It was you know, it was a way of uh, showing that the, the nobility of Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib. And so, he then, he also mentioned, he said that, you know, the king's soldiers have taken 200 of his camels. And this was the introduction given by that Runafar to uh, Anis. Right, of Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib and then he took him to see Abraha and he gave him again a befitting introduction and he got permission for Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib to see Abraha. Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib he was extremely uh, handsome and extremely beautiful when, and physically from his face you know the nobility could be seen in his face in his expressions and so, as soon as he saw him, he immediately understood that this was, uh, this was not any ordinary person. And so, he, Abraha, he naturally, he felt drawn towards him and he wanted to respect him. And he was, he was a bit stuck because he wanted him to sit next to him on his throne, but then he didn't want to feel undermined. Uh, you know, by his own people. He didn't want to undermine his own authority over his own people. And so, um, but he didn't want to sit on his throne and then have Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib sit on the floor. And so what he did was he came off his own throne and he had, uh, he had a seating laid out on the floor and he sat on the floor himself with Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib. So he, he left his own throne to sit with Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib uh, on the floor, on the ground. And so he treated him very uh, honorably and very respectfully. And once they got talking, he said, what brings you here? Why have you come to see me? And Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib, he responded, I'm sure you all know this response, this is very famous. He said to him, I've come 
uh, because your soldiers have, uh, have taken 200 of my camels and I want them back. Now, the Abraha looked at Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib and he said that when I saw you, I saw signs of, of uh, nobility and I thought you were uh, an honorable and noble person and I've left my throne and sat on the floor next to you but now that you've opened your mouth, you've ruined all of that perception. Uh, I've lost all the respect that I have for you. I've come to attack your people, I've come to attack your city, your place of worship, and all you're worried about is your camels. You know, that, to him, uh, that was the perception that he had at that moment. And so, he, he said, he said, that's your, you know, that it, it's a significant piece of your history. Something, it's your heritage from your, from your forefathers, it's your place of worship. And you've no fear for, your, for that. And yet you want your camels. And I'm sure you know the response as well. See, Abdul Muttalib, he said to him that, uh, I am the owner of those 200 camels. That house that you've come to demolish has an owner as well. I will worry about my property and I will let him worry about his property. So that was the response. Note also, one thing you need to note, and inshallah uh, in the next couple of sessions we're going to be discussing in detail the Iman of the parents of the Prophet and everyone in the lineage of the Prophet to that effect, not just the parents of the Prophet. So that's something that we're going to discuss separately in detail. But these kind of responses you know, from these ancestors of the Prophet ﷺ, they tell us that they were firm believers in the unity and oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he very clearly said to him, he said, I, I am the owner of the camels and the house, it also has an owner. And I will leave, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to worry about my property and I will let him worry about his property. And so after this discussion, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib, he came back. He told his people about this discussion, what Abraha was intending. And he said to them, he said, leave Makkah, leave the city, go out into the mountains, find uh, somewhere you can, uh, you can hide out in the mountains uh, and find a cave or anywhere in the mountains. But leave the city because if you're here, when he launches his attack, you may suffer, you may be killed. And so, um, he then, after giving this message to his people, he then came to the Kaaba. And he, he, he stood beside the Kaaba. And he said, that, Oh Allah, Abraha has come with the intention of demolishing this house. And I have come to ask you to grant us protection and victory uh, over uh, Abraham. And Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib at that time, he recited some uh, couplets, a poem, um, and he prayed in, in that form to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the, the same thing was mentioned in that poem. And it was, La humma inna al-abda yamna'u he said, oh Allah, even a person, an insignificant human, you know, insignificant in comparison to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his might and his power. He's saying that even an insignificant human looks after his property. He looks after his saddle. You know, metaphorically speaking, his property. And so you, I ask you also to look after and to protect your property. لا يغلبن صليبهم ومحالهم غضوا محالا. Said that I don't want it to be the case that their cross, صليب is Arabic for cross because remember they were Christians. Said I don't want it to be the case that their cross is dominant over your Kaaba. I don't want the cross hanging over or, on, or being hoisted onto the Kaaba. 
ان کنتا تارک ہوں وہ قبل تنا فمر ما بدا لکھ سیو دم دین آئی ڈونٹ وانٹ دم ٹو بی ہوسٹنگ اکراس آن ٹو دا کابا اینڈ یو آر دا ون ہو کین لیو آور ہو کین پروٹیکٹ آور قبلا اینڈ این شور دیٹ اٹ از فری یو نو اٹ از اٹس ناٹ ٹیکن اٹس ناٹ سیزڈ اینڈ یو ڈو ایز پلیز از یو this was this was the translation or this is what he said in those verses that he's recited and he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after this prayer sayyidina abdul muttalib himself also left makka and he went into uh, he took uh, a refuge inside a cave and mulla ali qari rahimahullah ta'ala He writes about the virtues of Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib. He says, مِن فَضَائِلِ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ Amongst the virtues of Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib is that إِنَّ قُرَيْشًا خَرَجَتْ مِنَ الْحَرَمِ لَمَّا قَدِمَ عَلَيْهِمْ أَصْحَابُ الْفِيلِ That the Quraysh left Mecca when the people of the elephant This is giving you an alternative view, historically speaking. Mullah Ali Qari, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that Amongst the virtues of Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib is that everybody else fled from Mecca. They left the city and they went into the mountains and so on. When the people of the elephant uh, came towards Mecca, وَقَالَ هُوَ And he said, and هُوَ He means here Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib said, وَاللَّهِ لَا أَخْرُجُ مِنْ حَرَمِ اللَّهِ I swear by Allah that I'm not going to leave the haram, the sanctuary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's an alternative view that he himself, he instructed his people to go find safety in the mountains, but himself he remained in Makkah, he remained in the city, he remained in the Haram. In the next morning, Abraha decided to launch his attack. on Mecca. He took his elephant that was named Mahmud. This was uh, sort of the, le- the lead elephant amongst all of his elephants and it was named Mahmud. And his intention was to march towards the Kaaba and demolish the Kaaba. And he would then return back to Yemen. When his people, they tried to direct his elephant, Mahmud, towards <coughs> Mecca. Nufail bin Habib, this was the second captive. If you remember, the first one was that Yemeni leader. This was the second captive. This was the Arab leader who had also raised an army with some of the tribes around Mecca. But he'd also been defeated and he'd been taken captive as well. He came. And he came up to the elephant and he stood next to the elephant and spoke to the elephant quietly. And he said to him, Abrik Mahmood. He said, O oh Mahmood, sit down. Sit. Aw irja rashidam min haythu jitta. Or go back the way you've come. So he said to him, sit down or go back the way you come فَإِنَّكَ فِي بَلَدِ اللَّهِ الْحَرَامِ Because you are now in the sanctuary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are in the holy city and the sanctuary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said this to the elephant. As soon as he said this to the elephant, it sat down. Telling you how these, you know, even the animals, they honor the sanctuary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, some of the things, uh, many of the ulama have mentioned many things about the haram. Uh, if you read the tafsir, uh, uh, Surah Baqarah, where it mentions, uh, you know, the maqam Ibrahim and so on, and uh, that being a sign of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will see in uh, tafsir, in commentaries of the Qur'an, that the ulama have written many things about the sanctuary of the haram. The fact that no animal ever attacks another animal within, within the confines of the haram. 
because they know it's unlawful to do so. You know, the amount of pigeons that you see uh, in, in Makkah, it's, uh, it's quite amazing, right? But the ulama have said that all those birds, the pigeons, other birds, um, in such huge quantities and numbers that are there, in spite of that, you will never see any of them flying directly above the Kaaba. Um, and if any of them are injured, in that case, they will fly into the vicinity of the Kaaba and they will become cured. Or if they fall ill or if they're injured and so on. So there's many things like that. And again, this elephant was told that you are now in, you know, heading towards the sanctuary, the Haram of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it sat down. And Nufail bin Habib, um, he then basically, he, after doing this, he then, he, he ran. And he, um, he deserted them and he ran and went into the mountains. They started beating this elephant, Mahmud, in order to get it to, you know, to move. But it just wouldn't stand. And it was as if it was refusing to stand. They even started to prod it with metal sort of uh, spears and so on. And it began to bleed very badly. It became cut and bled, but didn't stand. They started poking its stomach and injuring it and causing it to bleed severely. But again, um, they, the elephant wasn't moving. It didn't stand. It, he was covered in, in blood, but... It didn't move. When they they then directed it, instead of Makkah, they directed it in the opposite direction towards Yemen. And as soon as they directed it towards Yemen, it got up and started walking. And so they they began to slowly figure out that he's not going to and then they directed it towards Syria. In the direction of Syria and it started walking. Running even. And uh, then they directed it uh, towards the towards the east, and again, you know, it it began to walk or run. But then again, when they tried to direct it, after trying all these directions, when they tried to direct it towards Makkah, sat down, wouldn't budge and wouldn't move. During this time, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sent the Ababil. That you hear about, in, uh, that you read about in Surah Fil, small birds, and in their beaks and in each of their claws, um, Allah Subhanahu in their feet, Allah Subhanahu Taala uh, had had instructed them to carry small pebbles. A small bird, you know, how how big do you expect that sort of pebble to be that they're going to be able to hold in their claws and in their beak? You know, quite tiny. But they came and they had targets. Some narrations even mentioned that they had, you know, they, they had specific tar named targets, each of those uh, pebbles. And not a single one of them missed their target. Came out of their beak or out of the, the claws, came down and cutting through the person and the animal or the elephant or other animal and straight into the ground. And that, that, was, that was the end of, of, of those people. And so, immediately when they saw this happening, first of all, um, it, um, the, out of them, coincidentally, there's something else that we well, we'll come to that in a moment, but uh, as the birds came, you know, the they dropped and, and it actually mentions that the size of those pebbles was like the size of, they were about the size of a chickpea. They dropped them, cutting through all the metal armor, the bodies, the animals, everything straight into the ground. And once this began to happen, obviously there was complete panic within that army. They, str they tried looking for Nufail bin Habib. Remember, he's the one who said to the king that let me live and I'll guide you towards Makkah. And he was the one who told Mahmud not to move. And then he'd run off into the mountains. And so now they had no guide. They didn't know which way to go. They were stuck. And so 
they tried looking for him, they couldn't find him. They, they had no one to direct them back towards Yemen. And they realized that he'd run off. And he was watching, he was in the mountains actually watching what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was doing to these people. And this is when he actually said the, these few couplets, he said a few couplets as well. Ayn al mafar wal ilahu talib. This is a really amazing expression. He said, Ayn al mafar where are you going to run to? Wal ilahu talib, when God is looking for you. And so he was watching. He was watching them being destroyed and this is what he was saying, he said, where are you going to run to when, when, God, is, when God is in your pursuit? And uh, there's a few other verses, well I'm going to leave them and move on. Basically, you know, he, he describes what was happening to them in his words in this point. It's mentioned that there were 13 elephants in the army of Abraha. That's 13, including his lead elephant, which was Mahmud. And all of them were destroyed, except for Mahmud. So in spite of, you know, those, uh, those pebbles being, you know, having named targets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the lead elephant, Mahmud, because of his show of honor, for the haram and the sanctuary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him and uh, he was not killed. They ran from there, but like I said, every one of those stones had a named target. None of them survived. They were all killed. And Abraha in particular, you know, his state was pitiful. And they took him and they tried to flee from there but literally they sort of their their limbs began to fall off and fall apart as they were moving from there and that's how they uh, they were destroyed their their limbs began to fall apart their bodies became infected and they had sort of uh, infected material oozing out of their wombs and their bodies and this is the state that they died in. And it's mentioned even in some states, it mentions that as they were leaving, gradually, you know, his body began to disintegrate when they came to a place called Sana'a. At that time, all that was left of him was the size of, size of a, a, a moderate-sized bird. That was all that was left of his body. But even at that point, for the hatred that he had in his heart for the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what was left of his body, his chest actually exploded and his heart fell to the ground. And this is how he, you know, this is how he died. This event took place on the 1st of Muharram and this was 800 years after Zulqarnain. 800 years after the time of Zulqarnain. And 820 years. This happened in the time of Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib and this year then became known as Amul Fil, the year of the elephant. And this is the same year that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born in. And so this actually, knowing the details of this story, when you recite that, uh, the Surah, surah Al-Fil, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-Fil, you should then have this sense of what this would have meant to those people because remember there will have been people around at that time who had witnessed this with their own eyes right? so when the Prophet ﷺ announced his prophethood at the age of 40 anyone who was over the age of 40 was alive when this happened yeah? and, and they would have witnessed this first hand so this is part of you know, the impact of the Qur'an and Majid on these people. 
And just to finish off with uh, with Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib and the, this discussion around him, Imam uh, Sayyid Mahmud Alusi, he's written about Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib and given a, a bit of a description of Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib. And he says that وَقَدْ كَانَ عَبْدُ الْمُطَّلِبِ يَتَلَأْلَأُ عَلَى وَجْهِهِ النُّورِ and, uh, and inshallah we're going to wind up with this uh, description. And he says that uh, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib, his face always was radiant and sparkled with nur. Yatala'la'u means, you know, it literally means to twinkle or to sparkle, to be radiant with nur. وَقَدْ كَانَ عَبْدُ الْمُطَّلِبْ يَتَلَأْلَأُ عَلَى وَجْهِهِ النُّورِ You could see nur and light radiating from the face of Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib. وَتَلُوحُ فِي أَصَارِيرِهِ عَلَامَاتُ الْخَيْرِ And from his stature you could sense and you could perceive khair and barakah just from his physical stature. وَكَانَ يَأْمُرُ وَلَدَهُ بِتَرْكِ الْبَغْجِ وَالظُّلْمِ He would always instruct his children to stay away from any kind of cruelty and oppression and rebellion. And وَيَحُثُّهُمْ عَلَى مَكَارِمِ الْأَخْلَاقِ he would always encourage them to adopt the best conduct and the best character. وَيَنْهَاهُمْ عَنْ سَفَاسِفِ umur, And he would always discourage them and prohibit them from adopting lowly conduct. وَكَانَ مُجَابَ dawa. He was someone whose du'as were always accepted. Mustajabu da'awat, another word, but here the wording used is Mujabad da'wa, same meaning. That he was, his du'as were always, his supplications were always accepted. Waqad harram al khamra ala nafsihi. He had made drinking wine or alcohol, he'd made drinking wine haram upon himself. He had prohibited himself from drinking. وَهُوَ أَوَّلُ مَنْ تَعَبَّدَ بِحِرَا He was the first person to ever go up into the cave Hira and worship there and meditate there. So this was a custom that was uh, laid down by his grandfather that the Prophet ﷺ used to follow as well, going up into Ghari Hira and into, into that cave. وَكَانَ إِذَا رَآ هِلَالَ رَمَضَانَ Whenever he saw the crescent moon of Ramadan, in other words, the advent, the start of the month of Ramadan, صَعِدَ إِلَى حِرَا He would go up to غَارِ Hira, up to cave Hira. يُطْعِمُ masakin. He would feed the poor, the needy. وَيُرْفِعُ مِنْ مَاعِدَتِهِ لِبْطَيْرِ وَالْوُحُوشِ Fi ru'usil jibal says that um, his spread, his dastar khan, always, you know, it had provisions even for birds and wild animals, wild beasts. They would come down from the mountains and feast on his spread. An expression of his generosity, that his generosity extended not only to people but also into the animal kingdom as well. وَكَانَ يَفُوحُ مِنْهُ رَائِحَةُ misk. And I think this is probably one of my favorite, one of the most beautiful of his descriptions or his, his attributes, his uh, qualities. That وَكَانَ يَفُوحُ مِنْهُ رَائِحَةُ misk. Naturally, there was naturally a most beautiful order of musk that would emanate from his vicinity. 
that that was naturally part of his of his person not having the need to to use fragrance without using fragrance and it says wa kana yafuq minhu ra'ihatul miskil azfa the purest musk not just musk it says that the this most beautiful scent of the purest musk would emanate from his body wa kanat quraish idha asabaha qahd whenever the quraish were afflicted with drought yastasquna bihi they would seek from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rain they would seek rain from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through him yastasquna bihi they would use his mediation they would present him as a medi- mediator and they would seek rain from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fa yusqihum allah ta'ala ghaythan azeeman and in response allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would grant them abundant rain so whenever they suffered a drought they would take him and to you know for example take him along to go to the top of a mountain and pray to allah oh allah for his sake give us rain and allah would send and give them abundant rain and all of this you know this nur on his face these descriptions the musk you know doesn't what does it remind you of right doesn't doesn't that look the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam without having to use any fragrance uh, naturally you know this the, the most sweet fragrance emanating from his from his person from his body right so in my mind these are effects of that nur traveling through these ancestors of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and blessing these people with some of the characteristics that were in the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself right people the sahaba and this is it's a most beautiful topic if you uh, if you didn't attend the lectures uh, the shamail series um it's on uh, youtube watch it right and 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 uh, learn about the fragrance of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and how the sahaba they would know the streets that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had walked through because they could smell his fragrance after he'd gone right they were able to follow the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's beautiful fragrance to know where he'd gone and how you know sayyidna anas bin malik radiyallahu ta'ala and other sahaba they they describe the fragrance of the prophet sallam he says that the prophet sallam i shook hands with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and it was like as if the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had taken his hand out of a uh, fragrance seller's uh, casket his his box of fragrance that's how fragrant and he said for days i could smell that fragrance on you know on my hand right, this is the fragrance of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and that sayyidna uqba bin farqad radiyallahu ta'ala right who who had four wives competing amongst each other to try to find a fragrance better than his and eventually when they gave up and asked him where do you get your fragrance from he told them that this fragrance was a blessing of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he was a young boy he developed spots on his body and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had asked him had sat him in front of him and told him to remove his shirt and place some of his saliva on his blessed hand and rubbed it into his body and not just giving him instant recovery from his illness but also for the rest of his life you know granting him um, a fragrance that was unmatched by anyone else he was he was, he was recognized by that fragrance in groups of people you know say that umm sulaim radiyallahu ta'ala anha taking the beads of perspiration from the body of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and when she was asked why by the prophet sallam she said we're going to mix this and it's it's really it's rather beautiful how she said we're going to mix it with other fragrances so that this will then become the best fragrance ever you know it, it you you can take what you want from it but my perception that you know it, even the tiniest trace of the perspiration of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is sufficient and it's enough to make any fragrance uh become the best fragrance in the world 
And so doesn't need to be applied directly. It's mixed in you know small quantities, maybe a drop of a drop of it mixed into a larger container of uh, of fragrance uh, to give it that uh, that perfection. What's that from? That's from the you know from the perspiration of the Prophet <coughs> You know, it's sort of uh, it's something to think about, especially when you have people you know saying that they trying to to say that. The, that they are like the Prophet ﷺ in some way, or that the Prophet ﷺ is like them. You know, um, I, I'd love to see someone uh, going near them when they're perspiring, and the Prophet ﷺ's <coughs> perspiration. Yeah, and also see that Aisha Siddiqa radiAllahu ta'ala anha coming back after relieving herself after the Prophet ﷺ has been. And coming back and saying to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, there's, there's no traces of anything. All I can smell is musk. So, it, it tells you something. Then, when you consider all of that, and then that description of Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib, I just find it mesmerizing. I think it's just uh, absolutely beautiful. But he had this natural fragrance of musk emanating, the purest of musk emanating from his person, from his vicinity. And in in my mind, that's the you know that's part of the blessing of carrying the nur and being given the honor of being a custodian of this uh, nur of the Prophet which was then passed on to his son Sayyidina Abdullah. I'm going to stop there. Um, we sort of uh, we are coming round to uh, our time anyway. I don't want to move on because I'm not going to be able to complete uh, the next uh, part of our journey, which is looking at Sayyidina Abdullah, ta'ala, father of the Prophet. So I think the next few sessions remaining, I can just give you an overview of what's to come. Um, in the next few weeks that we have, um, I think this course is shed scheduled to continue until uh, the week of Eid. And then, inshallah, I'm going to have a break that week, and then we'll be advertising um, the next series or whatever's next um, during that time. The few, the few, the few weeks that we have left, the main focus will now be the parents of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and in particular, the iman of the parents of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is something that I feel very, very strongly about, and you know, I think it's part of the beauty of iman. Somebody who doesn't honor and respect the parents of the Prophet ﷺ has never experienced the true sweetness and beauty of Iman. You know, I could never respect my own mother if I, you know, if there was any element of disrespect uh, in my belief for the parents of the Prophet ﷺ. You know, I could never expect myself and my parents to achieve salvation if I expect if I did not expect that for the parents of the Prophet ﷺ. And you know, everything. Um, it, it's just an amazing feeling and sensation um, learning and talking about the parents of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I think the one thing that you can take away from this studying, this lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his ancestry, is that, you know, this is, this blessed lineage and this blessed ancestry, this is something that was arranged by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Not, you know, it wasn't random it was a selection. Yeah, that's the important thing. This was a selection. And every single one of the ancestors, male and female of the Prophet wasallam, were the best of people at that time. And so this was a pure selection by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, we will talk about that in more detail when we talk about the iman of the parents and the ancestors of the Prophet in some, uh, in some detail. And inshallah, if we can get through that, then the next topic is going to be the, the, the birth of the Prophet وسلم, and miracles around the birth of Milad and so on. So um, we'll stop there. Um, thank you for your attendance and inshallah I hope to see you uh, at the same time, uh, quarter past uh, seven.